Andrew would like to would like to know how to use the support and resistance solver. So yeah, you know that solver is uh, um, probably the most complex one, but it can also be the you know most useful one as well. All right, so what I'm going to do is. Um, all right, I'm going to throw an indicator up here to use inside the support resistance solver. And that indicator is actually, I'll, I'll just do the pivots. So I'll use NinjaTrader's pivots. Um, one thing to note when using um, the pivots indicator. Um, NinjaTrader has confirmed this as, as, a, as a bug as well, as an internal bug that you, you can only use uh, the pivots indicator from calculate, uh, calculate from intra, intraday data. This is the only way that you can use, um, oops, ah, sorry, uh, this is the only way that you can use the pivots indicator inside of Bloodhound or inside of a strategy. So there's already a known uh, ticket issue on NinjaTrader's support website for this. So, yeah, so they, they, they NinjaTrader has acknowledged that using daily bars uh, isn't reliable. So you don't always, once again, this is a, in, uh, a hit or miss, you know, intermittent kind of issue. You know, sometimes daily bars will work, um, sometimes it won't. So if you want something reliable, you actually have to use intraday data with the pivots indicator. Um, all right, so let's get this on the chart. And um, okay, so we can see the R1 here. And let's go back and see if there's any other pivots. Well. Oh, there's R2. Okay. All right, that works good. Okay, let me remove Raven off the chart here. And All right, so I'm going to add the support resistance solver on here and the uh, majority of people will most likely use uh, an indicator right so in the support resistance solver you'll want to set this to true because you'll typically want to be using an indicator All right. Um, so you can see that this new field just opened up as soon as I set this to true. If I put this to false, you see that that whole section disappears. So set that to true and this indicator section appears. So I'll go in here and change that from the SMA to my pivots indicator. All right, so I can double click on the indicator or I can click the add new button. Um, now up here in the settings, I need to. I'm going to take it off of daily bars and set it to intraday data. Um, there's really nothing else to set here. So the next step is I can decide, you know, which of these pivot lines I want to use. If I want, I can use the PP, uh, R1, and S1. If, I, if I'm only interested in those, then I can just select those. Um, you know, or if I want to use all of the uh, pivot lines, I can just select all and you can see that this solver this solver is unique because it allows you to select every available plot so that way you know the support resistance solver can actually analyze you know many many plot lines um, so that's you know that's a little different from the other solvers so I'll click OK um, right so that set up my indicator um, that I'm going to use. The kind of the next step is, you know, deciding whether you want to use 
headwind mode or tailwind mode. Now to kind of give a brief explanation, headwind mode, that's used to determine to make sure that you have enough clearance to take a trade into resistance. So to give an example, let's say um, your you know Bloodhound system says, you know, hey, take a long trade, take a long trade here. You know, you got some uh, a system that says, you know, hey, take a long trade here. But we can see that we have R2 right up above. So, you know, if you were kind of trading discretionarily, you know, you'd be looking at this R2 line going, wow, you know, do I have enough room to take a long trade into that? Um, you know, so that's a decision you would make. So that's what the support resistance solver will do in, in your, you know, in your system development is, right, in headwind mode, it'll check to make sure that you have enough clearance to actually trade into um, R2. It'll check the distance here. So what it's actually doing is headwind mode is checking the distance. So if, um, yeah, so if I put this arrow on here, right, this arrow basically is identifying, you know, the, the distance between, right, the closing price of the bar to R2. Right, so that's what headwind mode will do is it'll make sure that you've got enough clearance to trade into resistance or into support. Oh. Now, tailwind mode, what tailwind mode does is tailwind mode, say that you have a you have a a whole different type of trading strategy and your trading strategy you know, uh, says, you know, go short right here. And so what Tailwind Mode will do is Tailwind Mode will make sure, it'll check to make sure that you are close enough to this resistance line to take, like, for example, a bounce trade off of R2. Right, so think of Tailwind mode as being used to take bounce trades off of support or resistance, right? And so it's going to make sure that you're close enough to R2 to, to do that, you know. Whereas if you know if your system, you know, said you know hey take take a take a um, a short trade you know way down here, well you're too far away from R2, and so you may not want to take that trade, um, you know. But so. So that's what Tailwind Mode will do, is, is check the distance of the closing price to R2 and make sure that you're close enough uh, to consider that a bounce trade off of R2. Um, all right, so you have to decide, you know, which mode do you want to use your um, the support resistance solver in. And, um, then, and then the next thing that you need to set up is the distances. All right, so we can see that we have this, actually I'll close this back up. All right, we have this distance targets section here. We have minimum distance and ideal distance. Um, you know, so this, having two different distance targets allows you to use Bloodhound's uh, fuzzy logic, but most people don't use that. So most people, you know, just want to know that, you know, when, when are you within a certain, you know, distance. So I would say, you know, starting off, just set both of these values the same. The easiest thing to do is just to set both of these distances to the same. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to change it from ATRs to ticks. Uh, ticks is a little easier to, to actually see on the chart. So let me change both of these measurements to ticks. All right. So now we're dealing with one tick and four tick. So let's just say, um, let's take a look at look at my distance here. So we have 54 cents 
up to 67 cents. All right, so that's 12 ticks away. So let's say I want to make sure that I have 20 ticks clearance to take my trade. So I could set my distance to 20 ticks. Right, and just just a reminder, I'm using headwind mode. Um, right, and, I, and I'm looking for a 20 tick distance. Um, so I can actually kind of illustrate what a 20 tick distance would look like. So let's go up to there. We go. Right, so this, this rectangle here is 20 ticks high. So from this bar, if I, you know, if my system uh, basically determined that I should take a, a long trade here, and I want to make sure that I have a 20 tick clearance from the closest resistance line, so R2 in, in this example is the closest resistance line. Uh, right, but we can see that my rectangle box, which represents a 20 tick clearance you know I need I need R2 to be you know outside this box area I need it to be a, above this 20 tick clearance but R2 is actually you know less than 20 ticks away and so if I look at Bloodhound's output basically Bloodhound is saying I can't take a long trade you see how there's no long output in this whole area this whole area there's no long output and that's because the solver is telling me I can't take a long trade because there's not enough clearance. But I do have a short output. So it is saying I can take a short trade. Right? So if I put this box down here, and if I uh, shrink my chart up, right? Look, here's R1 way down here. So R1 is well outside of my 20 tick clearance area. So I can't take a short trade into R1 because it's more than 20 ticks away, right? Um, so let's let me straighten out my chart. Okay, let's take a look at this um, one bar here. Let me mark it here with the dot. So, all right, you can see this one green bar right here that I have, and then I'll stretch my chart out a little bit. Right, so we did actually get um, a you know a, a long permission. So think of these, think of the output from this solver is giving you the permission to take a trade. So the support resistance solver is saying, you know, hey, I can take a short trade on any of these bars because I have this short output. Um, but there's only a couple of bars here where I can actually take a long trade. Right, so I, it's saying I, could, I only have permission to take a long trade when I have these green bars. Um, so let's take a look. So like right here, if we, if we take a look, we can see the closing price is actually on R2. Right, so that's saying, you know, essentially, we're, you know, price got up to R2. Um, so you know, it's saying that you, you could take a long trade because, you know, price essentially kind of could have broken through R, R2. Um, let's take a look at these, these other, these other bars here where we, we have permission to take a long trade. So if I set, um, if I set my rectangle right at the, uh, the the closing price of the bar, right, we can see. Look, it looks like we have about you know uh, one tick of clearance. So, you know, from from these two bars down here, there's actually it looks like there's 21 ticks of clearance. So there's just enough clearance to take a long trade from these two bars. So. Um, yeah, so 
Let's see. All right. So Andrew, that's kind of the 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 quick version of it. And for more detail, so uh, we have a video that will give you a lot more detail on all the other settings for the support resistance. Right. You can see there's a, a lot more settings in here for the support resistance solver. So what I'm going to do is I'll show you how to watch that other video. Um, all right, so if we're at the home page, right, I can go over to support and learn bloodhound. So let's see, I'll just actually click on learn bloodhound. Um, so there we go, and we can see there's a see this we have this menu here, and I can see under the bloodhound reference. So if I go to the bloodhound reference section, you can see here's the confidence solvers. And you can see here's a list of all the solvers, and here's the support resistance solver right here. So if I click on that, it'll bring up the documentation page for that. And you can see here there's a table of contents, and I can go to the video tutorial, click on that. And so this video tutorial will, you know, take, you know, will explain the uh, support resistance solver in a, a lot more detail. Also, there's some examples down here too. Some examples to, to help you um, help you understand the solver. So you could, you know, kind of build these examples and follow along to help help you understand how it works. So, all right. So, um, you know, keep in mind that actually all of the uh, all of the solver documentation have videos in them. Oops, what happened there? Yeah, so all of these solvers here, if you click on them, you'll see that um, they all have uh, a video link on them. Let's see, alright, so Andrew is saying uh, what I meant was current day open high low. Um, yeah, so Andrew, all you have to do is, um, you know, we could uh, put on there. Okay, there's the current day open high and low. And I'll make these a little thicker, make them easier to see. And let's make them a little brighter. Line. All right, so I'm just gonna I'm going to probably back up to the beginning of the day. Actually, let's see. Here's a here we go. Here's a new day start. Right, right there's my line. Um, okay. Let me shrink this up. And um, yeah, before I continue any further, I should. Uh, I should name this, you know, uh, Bloodhound file that I'm building here for the workshop. So I'm going to click on the change button, and since this is a workshop file, I'm just going to use a previous name that I've used and um, change the date. So, uh, oops. Change the name and the date. All right, save that. There we go. Okay, so now we can see I've got I've named my Bloodhound file. Okay, so back to the support resistance solver. So let's change the indicator. So if you want to use the open, high, low, close, all you need to do is go in here um, and change the indicator. So there we go. And you know, I'd say I want to use all of them, um, like so, right? And um, so, remember, I'm, I have this set to headwind mode with a 20 tick clearance. And so, essentially, 
this whole area right here you can see where there's no there's no output from this solver so what that's saying is that there's no clearance to take a trade in any direction so there's no there's, there isn't there's no clearance to take a short trade because the uh, low of the day is less than 20 ticks away and the high of the day is less than 20 ticks away but we can see as we price keeps climbing higher and higher um, it's you know this whole area we can see that you know the solver is telling us that we're far enough away to take a short trade um, you know except for this one bar so it looks like you know this this one down bar uh, the closing price was less than 20 ticks away from the low plot down here but then as price continues to move up right we have enough clearance to take a low trade or take a short trade into um, into the low of the day because remember I don't I didn't I'm let's see am I using the open oh I'm sorry okay yeah I am using the open yep so the solver is telling me that as price keeps moving up it's more than 20 ticks away from the open price so I can take a a short trade into the open price so um, yeah all right Andrew um, I hope that kinda gets you in pointed in the right direction there all right so let's see Eldon has a question going back to the support resistance solver can the tailwind mode be used for distance from another moving average instead of pivots? Yes, Eldon. Uh, I mean, you can put any indicator you want into the support resistance solver. Um, so, you know, I just use the pivots, um, you know, because it had multiple, it has multiple plots on the, on the chart. Uh, but if I want to, I could uh, let's see, let's see let's um, how about if we put an EMA on here? All right, so let's see how about put like a 55 EMA on here just to throw something random on there. Uh, all right, 55 EMA, and. Let me just adjust my chart here so I can see more bars. All right, so let's go, we'll go tweak this support resistance solver here. Um, so I'm gonna rename this. Okay. All right, so this is using the current open high and low. So what I'll do is I'll make a copy of it. Right, I'm gonna turn the other one off and this one. I'll rename this because it's gonna look at the EMA 55. Um, so let's just say you're kind of looking for maybe a bounce trade off of it, you know, off of your moving average. So Here's like um, a good example right here. You know, price bounced off that EMA right there. So, you know, how could we use the support resistance solver to determine, you know, when price could be bouncing off? Um, so, we're going to use tailwind mode. So remember, tailwind mode is when you're trying to determine when price is going to bounce off of a, uh, right, in, in, in a uh, support resistance level. And in our case, this EMA. So, all right. So I'll just set the indicator to the EMA, and uh, right. There's only one plot to select. Fairly simple. And so you'll notice. You notice how my distances went back to an ATR. That's because this solver actually remembers. The settings for each mode. So if I go back to headwind mode, look, it went back to the 20 tick distance settings. 
So this solver does actually have a memory for each mode. So what I'm going to do is put these back to ticks. You know, realistically, ATRs is a little better to use because um, it it right an ATR will adjust your distance based on the volatility of um, of the market. Um, right, so you can see that you know I'm I, I'm using a, a 150 tick chart. Right, and so we can see, you know, the bars, you know, have a different length. So as, as volatility picks up in the market, right, an ATR adjusts for that volatility. So that's why these distances default to an ATR. Um, so that way your system can adjust to volatility. Um, but I'm going to put these on ticks because ticks is very simple to visualize on the chart. Um, so let's just say we want to know when price gets within, you know, five, five ticks of that EMA. And so there we go. Let me stretch the chart out. So in this particular case, right, we can see the closing price actually broke below it, below the EMA. So you know, in this case, it, the support resistance solver didn't quite work out for looking for a bounce trade. Um, and then, right, when the bar moved up, you know, it moved up more than five ticks away, I believe. Let's see here. 56, 60, and... Oh. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know what? I didn't cover this. You know, this is probably one thing that you will typically want to turn off. I would turn this setting off. Must agree with swing trend. I would turn that off. Um, you know, that's kind of an advanced feature. And the uh, that video that I showed you on the documentation page will explain how this works um, in, in a lot more detail. Uh, so there we go. Turn that to false. And um, so there we go. So on this up bar, we got our long permission signal. You know, so remember, think think of these as giving permission to the rest of your trade logic to take a trade. You know, don't really think of these as trade signals, but think of them as permission. All right, so. Kirk's got a good question here. Um, Kirk is wanting to use uh, the comparison solver um, and he's trying to take an entry um, when the closing price is at least one tick below uh, an EMA but not more than 10 ticks below the EMA. Um, okay. All right, let's set that up there, Kirk. So, um, oops. let me set my chart up. Kirk is using that 89 period EMA. So we'll set this to 89. And let's change the color of this. Um, Alright, how about if we set it to green? Let's see if I can find an example. Um, there we go. I think that would be an example there. So it looks like, you know, the bar closed about one tick below the EMA. And so uh, I take it, Kirk, that you would like a, probably a long signal. Um, I'm not sure if you're looking for 
you know, a bounce off of the moving average or if you're looking for, you know, a break through the moving average. But um, either way, I guess it, it's easy to modify the, the comparison solver to account for um, any condition. So let's stretch that chart out a little bit. All right, so I'm going to add a comparison solver here. And we're using an EMA 89. And I like to shorten up the names a little bit. You don't have to, but it's something I like to do. Um, all right, so we're interested in um, interested in using the closing price. So we're going to be comparing the closing price to our EMA here. So we're going to set up indicator B as our EMA. So kind of the rule of thumb, you know, how do you, the rule of thumb, you know, you ask yourself, you know, how do I know, you know, which indicator do I put in the indicator A section and which indicator do I put, you know, in indicator B? So the rule of thumb is you want to put the faster moving uh, data, you know, data set. I don't want to say indicator because the closing price is not an indicator, but the cl the fastest the faster moving data set is typically what you want to put in, in in indicator A, and you know I can see that the closing price moves a lot faster than a moving average does, right? Especially in 89 EMA, so that's why I put the closing price up here. Um, so now now what we have to do is we have to go through and kind of read. Um, the descriptions of these various outputs here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set them all to zero. Turn them all off. Alright, so there's all the outputs are turned off so you can see there's no, no output on a chart anymore. So what we're interested is is when the closing price, right, which is indicator A, when the closing price is below the EMA, which is the EMA is indicator B. So we want to know when A, the closing price, is less than B, the EMA, by so many ticks. So what we're going to do um, is we're going to specify so the small amount we want that to be um, one tick and um, actually um, actually Kirk has actually has it a, a, um, a range here Kirk has a range so he's saying one tick to ten ticks so actually we're going to set this to the larger range so Kirk is saying it's actually okay to get a signal even if it's 10 ticks below. The, uh, if price is 10 ticks below the, the EMA. So we're going to set our large amount and small amount to 10 ticks. And, uh, you know, for some reason on my computer these uh, this description doesn't update itself. Uh, it probably is updating itself on your computer, but I have to usually click off and click back on the solver and now I can see my uh, description update itself. So we can see here when A, the closing price, is less than B, the EMA by 10 ticks, um, we can get an output. So if I set a 1 there, <laughs> it 
Doesn't look like I'm getting anywhere. Uh, 10 ticks might be a little too much, I'm sure. Somewhere. Okay, here we go. That's more than 10 ticks. Um, let's see. And if I go... Well, yeah. So, the, the issue is, is that when I have it set like this, essentially the, the um, closing price has to be essentially exactly 10 ticks away. Um, if I set this to 1, then what we're identifying is when the closing price is 10 ticks or more away, which is not exactly what we want. What we really want is to know when it's below, um, let's see, actually, yeah, let me think about this for a second, Kirk. Um, Well, I guess first, let me explain what this neutral is. So this neutral area essentially identifies when A is within a certain range of B, right? So we can see we have this, um, this, this range area. So that we have 10 ticks above B or 10 ticks below B, right? So if the closing price is 10 ticks above the EMA or 10 ticks below the EMA. That's what this neutral uh, output will identify. And when we can see that here on the chart. So we can see that uh, when the closing price, uh, let me stretch the chart out a little bit. So we can see like the closing price comes within 10 ticks of our EMA and we get a long output. And then the closing price falls away, and it's more than 10 ticks away, um, and so forth. So, um, yeah, so what I think, let's see, oh, okay, Kurt gave me a little clarification here, say a breakthrough in EMA. Uh, so, Kirk, do you want a short trade? Um, let me go back to that circle. So, Kirk, are you wanting a short trade when price breaks through this this EMA? So, Kirk. Um, I guess Kirk's not watching anymore. <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay, short. Okay, great. Short when the closing price is at least one tick below the EMA and not more than 10 ticks. Okay, gotcha. Thank you, Kirk. Um, and um, So I think actually this is gonna, I think this is gonna take a couple of this, couple of solvers here to accomplish this. Um, yes, yeah, this is gonna actually gonna take a couple of solvers to accomplish this. Um, all right, yeah. So give me a moment to kind of play around with this and figure this out. Let's see, 10, yeah. All right, yeah, this is gonna take two solvers here. Okay, so I've got one solver here set up to kind of identify when price is, you know, within, right, when price is within this 10 tick range. And once again, so I did set my small amount to 10 ticks, it's just that my text, for some reason, doesn't update on my computer. There we go. 
Uh, all right, so there we go. So I'm getting a short output um, when price is within right this uh, 10 ticks within when price is within 10 ticks of the EMA. Now what I need to do is I need to build another solver to filter out you know this this area here right so when price is above the EMA right we don't want a, a short signal here we only want it when price is below so I'm, it's going to take another solver to filter this 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 uh, these signals out so let's um, we'll have to work on the logic board now um, Let's see. All right, so there's the name for this logic. And what I'll do is take this existing node and drop it on here. I'll take a look at that. And I'll need to build another solver filter out when the EMA is actually up or when price is above the EMA. So this is the filter I'm going to or solver I'm going to make to filter that out. So let's see. So the settings are going to be pretty darn close, right? Indicator A is going to be our closing price and indicator B is going to be our EMA. And now it's just a matter of setting these outputs correctly. And you notice I left my large and small amount at, at zero ticks. Um, yeah. Well, actually, let's set this to one. Because actually, Kerr wants to make sure that the price is actually one tick away. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so if we take a look at this bar, right, it looks like most likely uh, the closing price is within, you know, one tick of that EMA, so there's, therefore there's no signal here. Uh, you know, probably just as a little safety factor, let's put in 0 0.99. Uh, you know, like so 0.99 of a tick. Just as a little safety factor there. Um, now, because the one thing about working with moving averages is they don't move in one tick increments, right? So if we, let's, let's, let's pop this up here, you know, NinjaTrader is telling us that hey they're one tick away but NinjaTrader rounds off the data right so this EMA could actually be 52 cents uh, 52.99 cents right this this EMA is not going to move in one tick increments but NinjaTrader rounds rounds the uh, the decimal points off to two um, so the actual value of the EMA could be less, could actually be less than 53, right? It could be 52.95 cents, something like that. So, you know, you might want to play around with, um, you know, setting a, a little filter, you know, like that, a little variance. Um, actually, uh, I want to set them both. Oops. There. So, just you know, just kind of a, a little uh, assurance. Um, all right. So now let's let's get back to the bigger picture. So I've kind of created the second solver here that identifies whenever price is below the EMA um, by one tick or more. However, it's also going to identify when price is, you know, well below the EMAs, right? So price is, uh, let's see, yeah, price is 
almost 20 ticks below the EMA, so we don't want that part. So that's what this other solver is going to do, is, is filter that out. So let me name this. So this is the um, close um, A little bit of a lengthy name, but um, it's always good to name your solvers so you know what they're doing. So now if I connect these two together, and bingo, see how it's filtered all of this out now? All right, so now there's no signal now whenever price is more than 10 ticks away from the EMA. And we can see here, price is above the EMA, so there's no signal. Um, trying to find some points on the chart where the closing price might be like, uh, there we go, perfect. Let me stretch this way out. So let's take a look at this bar right here. So, you know, it kind of looks like the closing price is about half a tick away and there's no signal there. Uh, and the same, same right there. You know, the closing price is less than a tick away and there's no short signal. All right, so that's how you do that, Kirk. Remember the first solver essentially identifies this first solver right identifies when price is just within 10 t 10 ticks of your EMA and then the second solver identifies when price is below your EMA and more than a tick away, right? So it took um, two two uh, set two solvers, right, to to set up you know two sets of rules to kind of make this work. Okay, um, let's see. Let's um, see what else is coming along here. All right, you're welcome, Kirk. All right, Ron's got a question here. Um, he's asking, could you show how to get a long output when the trend agrees with uh, the SI swings uh, and opposite? So, okay, you bet. So let's throw another indicator on the chart here. Okay, we're going to scroll down to the SIs and put the SI swings on here. Um, let's see, I guess we'll, we'll take a look at uh, a sensitivity of 3 and, okay. Alright, so we can see the lines drawn on the chart here. Um, actually, how about, I'm going to up the, uh, turn the sensitivity up a little bit. Let's see, turn it up to uh, let's try four. Right. Try five. I'm going to try and get rid of this little uh, pullback here. Six. So, 
Okay, so I'll use the swing sensitivity of six. It's kind of showing me the, the bigger uh, swing trends on the chart. All right. And let's open up Bloodhound. All right. Now that since I'm working on, since I already have a, a logic template created, then I no longer can work on the solver tab. You can see that uh, turning, you know, turning these solvers on and off actually has no effect on the chart anymore. You can see I've got them all turned off, but I'm still getting a, an output signal on the chart. So, you know, once you start, once you create a logic template, you always have to work in the logic templates. So, let me quickly create a logic template for the support resistance solvers that I built earlier. So, I'm just going to Let's see, yeah, I'm just going to drop them on here. Alright, and I can just connect them up and there we go. Alright, so for Ron's question, um, I'm going to add a see where is it um, there we go the uh, Dorsian swing trend solver here so this particular solver is actually tied in to the swings indicator I'll connect that up and let me rename the logic template there and there we go and if I want the solver to match the indicator on the chart I just have to change my sensitivity to match and um, yeah. let's see And our double top double bottom is, is one ATR. You know, really this this solver doesn't detect double tops, double bottoms, but I'm just gonna set the setting for this the same anyways because I don't know if it affects the calculation inside the indicator. So the SI swing indicator, I don't know, this this double top, double bottom setting might affect you know the calculation of um, uh, of the trend. So all right, so let's take a look here at what's going on. Um, so we can see we have a, a kind of a major downtrend here. Right, which was eventually identified at this point. And even though this swing, this swing is up, but what the indicator is identifying is the overall trend. So we can see this. So we're having the overall trend identified as down at this point. Um, and then you can see we get, you know, a pretty, pretty good, um, move up a good pretty good swing move up and um, then another pull pull back and then another up uptrend starts and so we can see that uh, you know once price kind of breaks this previous uh, swing high that's when essentially that's when a new uptrend is identified right so uh, you know as far as we know when price was moving up like this, this could have been just an extended pullback and then price could have kept on moving down. We don't know that until price actually bottomed out and started climbing higher again 
So right, so it, it takes a second uh, move up to to really know that you're in a possible uh, new uptrend. So that's what this solver is going to do for you. Um, um, let's see. So if we want to, you know, just if we want to identify, let's see the individual swings. Um, let's see. Let me take a look. This again, it's been a while since I've kind of looked at this. So let's see what we can identify here. Um, I'm going to try the threshold solver. And I'm going to set my indicator to the SI swings. And there we go. So let's make sure our indicator settings match. We got one ATR and a sensitivity of six. And um, yeah, if we look inside this indicator, look, it has all of this extra information, all of this. Um, extra data series so let's see all right overall trend all right yeah so the solver right this this uh, Dorsian swing trend solver is looking at the overall trend as I showed you but I think here we go if you want to look at just the swing direction, right, the individual swing directions, we'll take a look at this. I think this is what we want. And So let me scroll through the chart here and just double check something. Okay, yep, that's that's how we can access that. So let me go back to the solver here and show you how I set the solver up. Um, first I'll name this. Alright. Um, So just to reiterate, so this swing direction, I believe what what this data series contains is I believe it contains the values that are inside this data series. I believe what it is is, is it's a positive one when the right when the current swing direction is up. It's a positive one. And then when the current swing direction is down, I think it, it puts a negative one in this data series. So if we know that the values in that is one or negative one, then I'm using the threshold solver and everything is set to zero. And so for the long output, if the if if that data series is a one, then it's going to be you know greater than zero so it's going to be at a or greater right so it's going to be greater than than zero a one would be greater than zero and for the downtrend right the downtrend I think it equals negative one so that's going to be less than our zero threshold and so for the short output I'm using right basically zero or less that's the output I want is less than zero and if the data is greater than zero then that's what I want for my long output so if we look at the chart here, everything's matching up. Um, now you'll note that, of course, things are delayed a little bit, right? And that's because no indicator can predict the future. So there's always a delay in something. So to give you an example, um, 
Okay, let's just let's just look at the right edge of the chart. All right, so let's just say you know we're watching this in real time, and so another bar goes by, bar goes by, right? Prices you know keeps on moving down, moving down, and look here we can see uh, price started to move up a little bit, moved up a little bit again, moved up again, and finally price moved up high enough for the indicator to say oh I'm gonna start a new uptrend and so that's when this green line actually starts to get drawn is on this this bar here this first bar with this long output that's when the indicator is actually going to start drawing the green uh, uptrend line you know until price keeps on going up and up and up, up, up. keep on going and keep on going now we can see price is starting to move down a little bit right price is moving down again down oh price moved back up so if you're watching this in real time this red line this red dashed line is not actually drawn yet um, the indicator is still gonna hold on to this this green uptrend line And actually, oh, maybe here's a little trick that works sometimes um, to watch to see how an indicator forms in real time. Here's a little trick that sometimes works. It it all depends on the indicator. But I'm going to disconnect from my data feed. You have to be disconnected. And I'm go back to the chart, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna uh, reload Ninja Script, refresh the chart, and then I'm going to use the keyboard, the arrow keys on my keyboard. I can step through each one. Oh, so look at that. Let me back up here and do this again. So look. See how the line stopped? The line didn't go forward to the next bar. And see, boom, that line just updated itself. Update it again. And look, see how the line did not move to the next bar because it's marking the lowest point right it still that line did not update itself and bingo this bar made a lower price so the the line got updated if we step forward step forward boom Did you see that so let me refresh this again so see look Two bars have gone by and this line has not updated itself yet until I get to the next bar. And then the high of the bar uh, essentially made a high enough price where the indicator said, oh, look, there's a little minor uptrend right there. Um, so let's step through. So look, you can see the line is not updating itself because price is not making a higher high. And now the indicator gets updated. So, see, look, three bars went by and that line didn't update itself yet. Right, so the line has not updated yet, and there we go, then it got updated. So now you can understand why there's a delay in, in the solvers or the indicator's output here. And so we can see price is moving down, but the downtrend hasn't been identified yet not yet still not and there we go now finally price made a low enough low to identify right uh, a, a downswing and then in one bar boom price made a high enough move to change to an uptrend so okay um so ron i hope that uh addresses your question. All right, Don's got a good question here. Don says, can you analyze detrended price oscillator version 2 from Big Mike's? I don't actually know that, Don. 
um, you know, we really don't go and test every indicator out there. It's just a impractical, um, you know, an impractical possibility because there's just so much stuff out there. But Don, what we do have is I made a video where I tested about I think four or five different indicators to kind of walk you through the process of you know to see um, or to test any kind of third-party indicator you know to see if it works in Bloodhound to see if that indicator you know outputs its data that that Bloodhound can read so let me um, pull that up here let me get back into the VMware um, so let's see all right I'll go here so from our home page the way you can find this video for testing third-party indicators is if you go to learn bloodhound and then down to documentation so you'll see this menu on the right hand side here um, that has all the links to all the different documentations um, and let's see where is so here we go under bloodhound videos there's uh, this tips and tricks section and if I scroll down I'll have to scroll down close to the bottom here um, yep, you'll see there's a little tip for using the time session solver if I keep going down here we go uh, so how to analyze uh, a custom indicator in bloodhound so there you go Don this will kinda walk you through several uh, solvers that you can use to test to see if that indicator works so, alright alright so yeah, Robert's got a good question here Robert's asking can you put more than one instance of Bloodhound on the chart uh, yes you can you know um, NinjaTrader really doesn't have any restrictions as to how many times you can put an indicator on the chart you know so I can put Bloodhound on there you know a bunch of different times you know, of course, just, you know, keep in mind that, you know, the more indicators you put on your charts, um, uh, you know, and in particular, Bloodhound, you know, that you might run into uh, restraints of, you know, how fast your processor is. So if you keep adding, you know, multiple Bloodhounds onto multiple charts, you may find that, you know your CPU is not fast enough to calculate all that data um, you know it just it just depends on you know how fast your chart is you know how fast your charts moving um, or not so just kind of be mindful of that um, and of course it depends on how complex your bloodhound logic is so you know the more complex your your logic is you know in if you're using a logic template, you know, the more complex it is, then, then the more processing time it takes. Um, so, and of course, if you start adding multiple bloodhounds and you start, you know, um, multiplying all the processing time that's needed. So, I'm going to call it a day, and I uh, hope you guys all have a great weekend. Um, weather's starting to cool off around here, so it's nice to be outside in the weekends. So, um... Uh, you guys have a good one, and I hope to see you next Friday.